I insist that Okay, first question. I am a sister in Islam who is concerned, who is concerned about watching the complete lecture while the brother is in total view of me. Prevention being better than cure, should I not be lying my gaze and just listening for many sisters like to see what the lecture looks like? Please clarify. Okay, it's a good question. Alhamdulillah. Um, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said that the believing men and the believing women lower their gates. So it's not correct, as we know, for brothers and sisters uh, to be looking at each other. And uh, as we know, that the Prophet وسلم, said to Ali that the first gaze. The first, not the first gaze, but the glance, the first glance is, um, the first glance is forgiven. That means the glance, not the, I'm still the first one, still the first one. <laughs> so it's just the first glance, you know. However, you know, this is a very good question, inshallah. So, the only thing I know about this, uh, um, and I don't actually, I have not actually come across, uh, I don't know myself until now, of any scholar who actually prohibited uh, the sisters from looking at the, the people who are giving da'wah or who are the uh, scholars who are giving lessons. Allahu alam. I mean, I'm, they're probably, I'm sure they are, but I'm just saying I don't know about that. Okay? Um, we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to uh, talk in front of the women and used to speak to them but of course that's not a proof that they used to look at him um, however the only thing that I can think of by way of an evidence that might illustrate its permissibility is the, the, the narration where Aisha was looking uh, at the, uh, uh, the Muslim Abyssinians who were um, you know, doing their display uh, you know, fighting displays and skills in the mosque and to the degree that she was resting on the shoulder of the Prophet ﷺ for a long long time she said so how do you think a young girl you know she is looking and wanting to enjoy herself in that regard so meaning for a long time she looked at it so um, this is a type of illustration that if one is looking from a distance then Allahu Alif then some I know some scholars use this as a proof of that being a permissibility in that regard that's all I know from that issue. <coughs> anyway, that reminds me now of a good subject, inshallah, that we could talk about. Uh, and that is that uh, this is an advice to all the brothers and sisters. Of course, if you do find, uh, I think, of course, if you find that looking at someone, uh, a lecturer or whoever is a type of fitna for yourself then you should definitely uh, as the sister said Jazakallah prevention is better than cure it is better to have to subhanAllah keep you away, away from something than fall into something haram and then you know that would be very serious <coughs> uh, but I do recommend for the brothers and sisters what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended and that is to get married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is a very serious and important subject because I know not only in England but I've heard especially here also in Australia it seems to be a problem uh, that it seems that for some reason people are reluctant to get married and think or seem to think there may be more important things in life uh, but marriage is half of the deen and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said oh young men marry if you are able because uh, it helps to lower your gaze and guard, guard the private parts. This, of course, applies equally to the sisters. This applies equally to the sisters. The Prophet ﷺ advised the shabab, the youth, to get married. This is the advice of the Prophet. Or we could even say this is the order of the Prophet, if you are able. Able does not mean I need three cars, five houses, uh, nice bank account, you know, and so on and so forth. Ability means that number one, you, you are sexually able, meaning you are able to perform the act that takes place between a man and a woman. 
And the second definition of ability is, according to anyway, some of the scholars, is that you have a dwelling. You have a dwelling, a place where you can live. Uh, it doesn't mean even you have to own it, if you can rent it. If you have those two things, then alhamdulillah, you are able to get married. And then you should obey the command of the Prophet sallallahu in that regard, and you should get married, inshallah, if you have that ability to do so. And if you do not have the ability to do so, then you should dedicate yourself to fasting. You should dedicate yourself to fasting. That means you should fast in a manner that is not merely, you know, the normal sort of just in the Ramadan, for example. You should dedicate yourself to it. Meaning, fasting should be a solid program part of your, uh, you know, weekly program. At least I would think, Allah Alam, depending on the individual, at least. I would imagine that you would fast Mondays and Thursdays. Depending on the vigor of the individual, then, you know, it might be even good to fast once every other day. I think in Australia, you need to fast once every other day. Because <laughs> in England it's cold, you know, everyone sort of dresses here. <laughs> you mentioned that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were constantly worried about committing riyadh yet people as great as Umar uh, could give charity openly such as when he announced that he gave half his wealth in charity how did he attain this ability to rid himself of riyadh and do good deeds with sincerity? this is a very good question you see first of all nobody who is sincere thinks they are sincere. In fact, the scholars mentioned that if you think you are sincere, your sincerity is in need of sincerity. If you think you are sincere, if you think you have ikhlas, then your ikhlas is in need of ikhlas. Because a truly sincere person will never really believe that they have achieved sincerity. They will always be worried that their deed has been affected some way or another way by a riyah or by showing off. This is the condition of the believer. They are always between fear and hope. A believer will never imagine that I am sincere. Unfortunately you find people saying, I am sincere. If you only saw how sincere I am, subhanAllah, this person is really not sincere. A sincere person never thinks they're sincere. So Umar did not achieve a state uh, where he thought he was sincere. We don't attribute that to him. Rather, there was the condition of the companions that they were always worried about their sincerity, but they never really thought that they had achieved it. However, this brings up a very important issue. You see, if you do a good deed in order to please people and in order to show off to people, that is real. But if you leave doing a good deed, meaning you, there's a good deed that you want to do it, but you stop it because you think, oh, the people might think that I am showing off, then that's also showing off. That's also showing off. For example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted you to recite the Quran beautifully, and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people or those who recite the Qur'an beautifully and we should try to recite the Qur'an beautifully but if the person makes their recitation less beautiful because they're thinking if I make it beautiful the people will think that I'm showing off then he's showing off because the show off the person who is committing riyah is the person who does their deed for people not for Allah so that's why Omar it's not relevant whether they gave their charity secretly or they gave it openly. If there is a benefit in giving your charity openly and that you know that if you give charity openly you will encourage other people to give charity and that is your intention, that is a good deed. But if you say, oh, I'm not going to give this charity because the people might think that I'm showing off, then you're a show off. That is why the Sahaba in that regards, they did their good deeds. They did the good deeds, whether they were openly or whether they were privately. Whether the deeds were open, public or private, they did the deeds. The aim is to continue doing the deeds, but to make sure that it is directed purely for the sake of Allah. I hope, inshallah, everyone 
understands that point because it's an important point. Assalamu alaikum. After hearing about the severity of speaking without knowledge, I am scared to say anything. <laughs> if someone asks me if something is haram or halal, is it compulsory for me to answer them if I know of an opinion on the topic? What if there is another opinion by another scholar that I am not aware of? Should I keep quiet instead and tell them to ask someone else? Jazakallah khair. No, the condition is, brothers and sisters, if you have a piece of knowledge, then it is not permitted to hide it. Whoever is asked about something of which they have the knowledge and they hide it, then Allah will make them wear a bridle of fire on the Day of Judgment. So if you know something and you are sure and you have a degree or a good degree of certainty or that your certainty is more than your doubt, that some scholar who is trustworthy has said this or that, then it is sufficient for you to say, as you heard me say, for example, I think it was yesterday or was it even today, subhanAllah. So we're rolling into one thing. That I, for example, quoted Sheikh Uthaymeen. I said, Sheikh Uthaymeen said this and that, and this is what his opinion is, and this is the only thing I know on that topic. So that's enough for you to say that. Well, such and such scholar said this, and such and such scholar said that, and that is what I know from the topic. Or you say, Ibn Abbas said this, or Ibn Abbas said that. <coughs> you know that that is, uh, you know, from Ibn Abbas or from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But you are sure that this verse of the Quran has this meaning, and you sure, and you are sure from knowledge that it has that meaning, that it is upon you if someone asks you to convey it. However, it is something worth pointing out that the Sahaba never liked to give fatwa. If someone asked them for opinion about something, they would always like to refer to somebody else. They would always like to refer to somebody else. They, they did not rush to give fatwa. It's quite the opposite. They would say, ask someone who they considered to be no, more knowledgeable. So they would do that. They would rather prefer that someone else was asked the opinion that they would have to say something and give a fatwa. But if you have the knowledge, and you know that this is from Islam, then you should, you have to speak about it. And you have to say it. it's not permitted for you to hide it. What we are warning against here is brothers and sisters, uh, people just advancing their opinions, speculating and guessing and thinking that this is something permissible to talk about Allah and His deen and to give fatwa even though you are not qualified to give fatwa. You have not reached the level of being someone who is capable of making his jihad and you go around making fatwa saying this is halal and this is haram and you don't have any capability of doing that Allah did not give you the means to do that this is speaking about Allah this is our knowledge do you think not wearing the niqab is a sin? what about the hijab? jazakallah khair okay um, Okay. The, there are two opinions amongst the scholars, the trustworthy scholars, that is. And the two opinions are that wearing niqab is wajib, and the other opinion is that wearing niqab is mustahab, recommended. As for those people who say niqab is an Arab custom, or it's copied from the Byzantines, it's nothing to do with Islam, then those people are people who speak about Allah and His deen without knowledge and they are lying about Allah and His religion. That is not true. The niqab is something that was worn in the time of the Prophet ﷺ by the women. The Prophet ﷺ spoke about it. The female companions, including the mothers of the believers, they used to cover their faces. In fact, Aisha, it was narrated from Aisha that we used to walk on the street and when the strange men came by, we would draw our uh, jilbabs over our faces so only we would look through one eye. So it is known that the female companions, including the mothers of the believers, they used to cover their faces in the time of the Prophet The only issue which the ulama differed about is whether it is obligatory for the woman to cover herself completely and to show nothing, not even her face, not her hands, or whether she is permitted to show her face and hands. Anyway, 
you know, I'm not going to go in all, into all the evidences and who says this and who says that and why this one has that opinion and why the other has this opinion. Uh, essentially, really, the whole argument boils down more or less to one hadith uh, which mentions, which is when Asma came um, into, uh, when the Prophet was sitting down, Asma came into the room and she was not covering herself properly or her clothes were you know, there was something not correct about them. The Prophet also turned away and he said, Oh Asma, it is not correct that or it is not permissible for a woman who each reaches the age of maturity that she should show anything except her face and her hands. So the scholars who believe that this hadith is authentic because there is an argument about the authenticity of this hadith. The scholars who believe this hadith is uh, authentic, they said that this shows it is permissible to show the face and the hands. So this is the only issue that the scholars argue about. Is it permissible or not uh, to show the face and the hands? So it's only whether the niqab is wajib or whether it is mustahab, meaning it's an obligation. If you believe that the niqab is wajib and there are no extenuating circumstances, for example, under threat of death or under threat of uh, not even that, it could be harassment or something like that. There, there are circumstances that might allow you not to wear niqab or even not to wear hijab. Then forget those for the moment. If you believe it's an obligation and that it's wajib, then you have to cover your face. And it will be sinful for you uh, not to do that. Uh, and if your belief is that it is only mustahab, then it's up to you. You can cover it and that will be more rewarding for you. Uh, or you can show your face and there is no sin in that. Uh, which of the two opinions do I think is correct? Allahu alim. But uh, I seem to, uh, it seems to me that wearing the niqab is something that is very near being an obligation. It is very near being an obligation. But it seems to me that it would be permissible to show the face and hands but Allah knows best. You spoke yesterday about Something, I can't read it. Riva. My parents have taken a home loan and bought a house. They said that when I get married, I can live in it and pay rent, which is paying off the loan. At the end, me and my husband will own the house. Which part of all of this is haram? Me paying the rent, knowing that it's going to a home loan, me owning the house, uh, after all, this is haram. Please answer me, you help. Okay. Um, you know, the thing is that I really only like to answer questions that I'm absolutely sure that the answer is, you know, subhanAllah correct. And I don't want to speak about Allah and His deen without knowledge, nor do I want to give a fatwa without the ability to give a fatwa. So, the sister, I'm sorry about that, but you have to ask a scholar who is capable of giving a fatwa on this issue. So I don't have the sufficient knowledge, I'm sorry to be able to answer your question, I'm really sorry about that. But I'm sure if you contact the brothers or sisters at ISNA, they will get uh, in touch with someone who has the capability to answer your question, inshallah. And they will maybe, they will, I'm sure they will definitely contact some good scholars and give you uh, a ruling uh, about that. Um, I work at a restaurant where Something is uh, born. What's born? Bacon. Bacon. Go on, it's a new word for bacon. <laughs> born is the. And so, at times I am. Uh, you have to handle it with gloves and tongs and so on and so forth. Is it haram for you to be working there? Uh, in general, from what I say, from what, the, from what I know, from what the ulama say, it is not permissible to work in a place where they are selling alcohol or pig or anything like that. Uh, this is a type of means of approving uh, of what is taking place in there. And if the brother cannot, uh, if the brother is able to find some other means of employment, and this is not going to put the brother uh, into a serious uh, type of you know, a, a greater evil. Uh, if the person stopped working, he may be put into a very bad situation, but otherwise he should definitely try to find uh, 
another job that does not involve dealing with haram things. If you committed a major sin which you truly were not aware of as being a major sin, what advice would you give? Our brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, if one commits any sin, as I said, the doors of tawbah are always open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is ghafoor rahim He is the most forgiving. He is the most merciful. He is the one who accepts the repentance of his slaves. So if you commit a sin, whether it is major or minor, then you should return to Allah, that you should recognize that your sin is something that you have done transgressing against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His command to you that you should feel, as I said, remorse and regret in your heart. You should ask Allah to forgive you and you should make every effort to keep yourself away from that sin and to keep yourself away from the things that lead you to commit that sin. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshaAllah, will forgive you. So this is what is upon us, that when we commit sins, whether they are small or large, we should repent. In fact, brothers and sisters, sometimes the small sins can be more dangerous than the major sins. Because sometimes we commit small sins and we don't really think about repenting from them. They're just small things. We look at the TV, we see, you know, nakedness, we listen to music, you know, uh, on the television. We do things that, in many respects, they are small sins. But because they are small and they happen a lot, we don't think about making tawbah from them. And the fact is that they accumulate. And they accumulate because every time you do a sin, a black spot appears on your heart. A black spot appears on your heart. And every time you do a good deed, a good deed, a white spot. And repentance wipes the rust, the right and the rust that is on your heart. So what one needs to do is keep on making repentance. But if you keep doing small sins, the black dots come until they cover your heart and make it dark and make it hard for you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so sometimes many small sins can accumulate and they can have the same effect as a major sin. So we should not take even, subhanAllah, the small sins lightly. So the doors of repentance are always open, whether the sin is major or minor, we should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Brother. There are sisters that wear an eye on a necklace. They say that it is for protection against the eye of the people, the evil eye. Okay, what is the situation with this? The situation with this that this is shuk. This is shuk. It is clear, unambiguous shuk. It is making partners with Allah. The Prophet said, as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he narrated from the Prophet that Tamima is shirk, that the talisman is shirk, the talisman is shirk, the talisman is shirk. Anyone who has any type of charm, any type of talisman, and they think that this thing, whether it is, and according to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, it doesn't matter if it has Quran or not. Any type of thing that you hang it and you wear it, whether on yourself or in your house or in your car, and you think that this thing is going to protect you from evil, from the evil eye, or from the shayateen, or from any type of evil, or if you believe that it is going to bring you some good, then this is shuk. Because you have attributed to this thing the power that only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah and the Prophet sallallahu said that the person who wears these things, then Allah will leave the protection of that person to that thing. Meaning the protection of it is nothing. It's really no different than idol worship. And people who worship idols and they pray to them and they think that they are going to get some benefit 
or be warded off from some harm. If you wear these things, thinking it is going to bring you some benefit or ward off some harm, it is shirk without a doubt. It is no different in reality than idol worship. And if someone was to say that, oh, I had such and such problem and I wore this talisman and the problem went away. Or any such thing like that. Then this has already been explained, subhanAllah, by the great companion Abdullah bin Masood, who came home one day and he found that his wife was wearing a charm. And he took it and he took it off his wife and he said, What? Shirk in the house of Abdullah bin Ibn Masood? And his wife said, Oh my husband, I had a twitching in my eye and I went to this Jew and he gave me this and it stopped. And he said, oh my wife, this was only a shaitan that was attacking you. But when you went to the Jew and you took the talisman and you made shirk, then the shaitan left you alone. In other words, to fool you into believing that this thing had power. And through it then you made shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, uh, these things are shirk. And if it seems to us that it has brought some benefit and brought some harm, it doesn't make any difference. The thing has been forbidden, it is making partners with Allah, and we have to be careful of the deception of shaitan. All of these things like eyes, and little beads, blue beads that are supposed to ward off the evil eye, whether you stick it on your neck or in your shop, this is all shirk. And it's something, of course, that if you die, it's something that you could cause you to die outside the fold of this land. SubhanAllah. May Allah protect us. Assalamu alaikum brother. A lot of people I know go to this lady's house. She reads the bottom of coffee cups. Yeah. <laughs> Telling everyone their futures. Wouldn't that be the same as reading and believing in horoscopes? Jazakallah fair brother. It is exactly the same. It is no different at all. If you read the bottom of the cup coffee pot, if you read the tea leaves, if you read the palm on someone's hand and you say this is your lifeline and here's how many children you will have and all that stuff. I know about all of that stuff from before I became Muslim. I studied all of that stuff. All of this is fortune telling. Coffee reading, palm reading, tea reading. If you look at the birds and you say all oh, the birds flying in this way is going to tell me that or this star in the ascendancy means that any of those types of things that is all from or you know sometimes people look in the insides of animals you know certain animals and things they do that still and they tell you you know what is going to happen according to that all of these things that anything that resembles it in any way shape or form tarot cards as well you know the tarot cards all of those things are from fortune telling all of that is kufr and all of that is haram Okay, an important point I want to make, I want to emphasize it again because a brother asked me. He said, and he mentioned, that, uh, he, and I want to remind you that you know when I said that the one who does it out of curiosity, their prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. I mentioned it, let me mention it again. That does not mean that you are allowed to stop praying for 40 days. <laughs> it's not funny because, yes, because then you will have two sins. You will have number one the sin of the fortune telling and then you will have the other sin which may even be covered of abandoning the prayer. You still have to pray. You still have to fulfill the obligation of the prayer. So you will have done the obligation only you will not get the benefit, the extra reward of the prayer. But you, you at least must still fulfill the obligation because you have to do that to be Muslim. So you can't say that, you know, oh I drank some wine because it's the same. If you drink wine, your prayers are not accepted for 40 days. Okay? But you still have to pray. It's an important issue, an important point. Okay. Salaam alaikum wa uh, I'm in year 11 and I go to school and I free mix with girls and I can't avoid it. So what do I do because... Wherever I go, I am going to put my eyes on a girl. Letting us in. MashaAllah. In year, year 11, how old is someone in year 11? 16, okay. As long as it's not 11, right? I put year 11. 
I'm getting worried about my son Abdullah. I said I have to get him married when I get back home. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah, I will be getting my son, inshallah, married when he's that age. I remember how I was when I was 16, so inshallah, I'm definitely going to do my best to get him married. And that's, inshallah, what our attitude should be, you know? SubhanAllah, is it amazing? That if our children get ill, we'll give them paracetamol, we'll give them antibiotics, we'll give them these things. But subhanAllah, our children are heading towards the hellfire. And we say, wait, 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 you're too young, you're too young, you're too young. SubhanAllah, you're too young. I tell you something, yeah? When you're 16, you're not too young to go to hell. You're not too young to go to hell. When you're 16, you are mature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels start to write your deeds. That means you are old enough to go to hell. SubhanAllah, think about that when you parents say you're too young. SubhanAllah, they're not too young to go to hell. We are supposed to save our children from the hellfire. Allah has made the parents and Allah has told us, save yourselves and your families from the fire. SubhanAllah, that is more important than any degree, any education, anything. SubhanAllah, what are you going to do on the day of judgment? Oh Allah, here's my degree. That's not good, that's not what's going to save you from the hellfire, brothers and sisters. Okay? So, subhanAllah, we have to avoid the sins and we have to take the means to avoid the sins. Anyway, I advise this young boy, inshallah, because obviously maybe it's going to be difficult for you to get the dwelling and whatever, and maybe your parents are not going to be sympathetic to your desires to get married. Inshallah, who knows? Actually, this is an issue, subhanAllah, really, it would be nice to talk about it. It would be nice to talk about it, and there are many ways, inshallah, if only we applied a bit of intelligence and we thought about it, and we were ready to admit that we're not anymore living in the villages in Lebanon and Turkey, you know, but we are now in Australia, okay, and things are different here, okay, and things work differently, you know, that's the reality, you know. There are pressures on our kids and our children and our children that did not exist in those times. You know, so we have to think of ways of dealing with this situation. Anyway, for this boy, Jazakallah khair for asking the question, then I advise you with what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised you: fast. You need to fast. You need to fast and dedicate yourself to fasting. This is something, alhamdulillah, that will help you to lower your gaze and protect your private parts. So this is something that you should do until Allah subhanahu wa taala makes it easy for you to get married. <laughs> okay, there's a question here that's uh, again it's similar to one that went before. Again, I think the listener is not really, the, the question is not really understood what I was saying. When I said and I talked about, the, anyway the question is, you said that most of the time you give fatwa, if you are passing knowledge to others, it is part of the deen and Islam, I, of course it is, you know. But I was talking about speaking about Allah and His deen without knowledge. Giving fatwa that was not based upon knowledge, I think that's pretty obvious actually from what I said, you know. I'm talking about speaking without knowledge, saying this is halal and this is haram without really having any knowledge that it's halal or haram. In fact, we may, we may say it and it may be a part of our culture. How many people you hear, for example, they say, and I'm sorry to keep bringing this example, but it's the most obvious one. Oh, polygamy, that was for them. Polygamy, that was for them. That's not for today. Oh, the hijab, that was for them. That's not for today. How many people you hear them saying that? About many different things in Islam. This is now giving a fatwa. This is speaking about Allah's deen. This is the things I'm talking about. I'm not talking about speaking with knowledge, having studied the Quran and the Sunnah, and knowing what the scholars have said about it. Of course, that is not speaking without knowledge. That's speaking with knowledge. What we were warning about was when you speak about Allah and His deen without knowledge. So, it seems clear to me, maybe I didn't make it right here. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. 
Okay, how should a Muslim look like physically, that is in appearance? Is there anyone who is without sin, major or minor? Will there be a lot of space in heaven and a crowded hell? Alhamdulillah, actually both the paradise and the hellfire will be, will be filled full. Allah will fill the paradise and He will fill the hellfire. SubhanAllah. As the question, I don't really understand, it maybe it's two different questions. How should a Muslim look like physically, that is an appearance? The reality is, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look to the outward appearance. Allah does not look to the outward appearance. Meaning, Allah does not look at whether you are handsome or ugly or short or tall or blonde and white or black and dark. Allah does not look at whether you are rich or you are poor, whether you drive this type of car or whether you drive that type of car or whether you don't drive a car at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at those things. Of course, if the appearance is part of the sunnah, is part of piety, for example, the Muslim woman's dress, then this is part of the appearance, of course, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does look at, because this is something that Allah has ordered. Or, for example, the man growing the beard, this is part of the appearance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does look at, because this is something that has been ordered. But it means Allah does not look at whether you are tall or short or this or that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He looks to the hearts. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He looks to the deeds. So the appearance of the Muslim in reality should be an appearance that is not necessarily, of course, it doesn't mean you go out of your way to look scruffy or something like that. If you can look smart, you should look smart. If you can dress well, you should dress well. In fact, it is part, it's from the deen that if Allah has given you his bounties, you should make that known, you should make that seen. You should make it seen. It is not part of faith that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you uh, bounties and his blessings, that you should walk around in rags. This is not part of Islam. That you should make the bounties that Allah has given seen. But the appearance, brothers and sisters, of the Muslim, subhanAllah, what is important is the, the appearance should be, in reality, of the good manners. The good adab, the good akhlaq, kindness, gentleness, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, overlooking of faults, being firm upon what is good, and being firm also against what is evil. These should be the characteristics and the outward appearance of the Muslim. SubhanAllah keeping their promises, fulfilling their trusts, speaking the truth, being good to your neighbors, being good to your parents. This should be the outward appearance of the Muslims. There are many things, brothers and sisters, that Muslims do. It really appalls me. It really appalls me. You know the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, the believer is not one whose neighbor, whose neighbor, he is not a believer whose neighbor is not safe from his mischief. He is not a believer. You will not find meaning the believer is not one who causes mischief to his neighbor. <laughs> In fact, you shouldn't find a Muslim causing mischief to anyone. You know, uh, I, I, I'm sure you're going to laugh, but how many people do this? They drive up in their car, beep, beep, beep. Yes? Doesn't a lot, don't a lot of Muslims do that? They drive, they couldn't be bothered to open the door and get out of their car and walk three yards to knock on the door and say, I'm here. Now what do they have to do? Beep their horn and disturb everybody. It could even be three o'clock in the morning. This is Muslims. How many Muslims park their cars all over the place, blocking entrances and blocking exits? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that means, you know? <laughs> I don't know. That's what I was told, right? <laughs> how, how can, really brothers and sisters, how can Muslims behave like that? How can Muslims behave like that? Muslims are considerate. We're supposed to be considerate. Thinking about our neighbors, subhanAllah. You know, this is how we're supposed to be. And if that is not your neighbor, it's another Muslim's neighbor as well. So brothers and sisters, these are simple manners. You know, every time we do something like that, and the people look at us, we 
have given a bad impression of our deen. We have given them one more excuse to look at us and say, look at these Muslims. Look at these people. You've given them and shaitan an opportunity to think bad about not only you, but bad about Allah, bad about the Prophet bad about this deen. This is a part of the trust, brothers and sisters, that we have as Muslims. When you do things like that, you are betraying the trust. You are betraying the trust. You're betraying Islam. That's the fact. If you like it or not, if you are a Muslim, you are an ambassador. Everyone will be looking at you and they will be looking at what you are doing and they will form an, an image of Islam based on your actions. They may not seem like big things to you, but really, subhanAllah, they are big things. And they can have a big effect. And similarly, just small kindnesses, small politenesses, good manners, good behavior, that has such a great and positive effect also. So this is how, my brothers and sisters, the outward appearance of the Muslim should be. SubhanAllah. Brother, would you please give advice on how to quit music? I was a musician. I quit playing a band two years ago, alhamdulillah. And I stopped listening to music a year ago, I'm not sure what. But last holiday I spent quite a while in my home country and started listening to music. I felt my iman decline drastically. Please give advice. I think that with all of these things, brothers and sisters, it is a question of refreshing ourselves and reminding ourselves of what Allah has said about this thing and what Allah uh, what the Prophet has said in forbidding that thing of thinking over and reminding ourselves of the evils. You know, subhanAllah, this is something you know we are all fighting with. Not just music, I mean the sins generally. I, all of us have something, have some sins, have something <coughs> that we are struggling hard. And sometimes, subhanAllah, our weaknesses get the better of us. But you know, again I have to repeat, that the way is the way of repentance. The Prophet ﷺ told us the sons of Adam, they sin by night and they sin by day, but the best of the sinners are those who repent. So as often as you commit a sin, then you have to repent. You have to make that sincere effort not to make that sin again. If there is something that keeps on leading you to sin, you know, for example, if you have a TV in your home and you just can't resist Turning it on when it's, you know, oh Kylie Minogue's on tonight or whatever, I don't know. But you have top of the pops here, I don't know, we're in England or something, you have, you know, the charts and you have the music and stuff. If you can't resist it, really, and the TV is in your house, then it's upon you to get rid of the TV. You have to. That's part of sincere repentance. You know, if you have a group of friends that whenever you end up going with them, you end up listening to music or you end up going to the disco or the, the nightclub or whatever, then you must keep away from those people. If you go to that country and every time you go back to that country you end up, you know, listening to music, you should keep away from that place. This is part of sincere repentance. So we have to remind ourselves that this is haram, Allah said, the Prophet said, what did the scholars say, what is the logic and even the reason and the rationale behind it. And these are some of the ways inshallah, and then making tawbah and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us firm in keeping away from these sins. And when we are away from them, being grateful to Allah, because if you are grateful to Allah, Allah will give you more. If you are grateful, you thank Allah, Allah thank you, and you thank Allah that He that He kept you away from the sins, then Allah inshallah will keep you away from the sins and keep on keeping you away from the sins. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, innovation forcing women to wear the veil in Afghanistan, forcing it upon someone, is it not accepted? Okay, um, well that depends. If the scholars in Afghanistan believe that wearing the veil, the veil is wajib, which is the opinion actually of uh, many of the ulama, then yes, then they are obliged to force people to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and they are forced to prevent them from disobeying Allah. This is what is Amr bin Maruf wal Nahim in al Munkar, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. This is the purpose of having an Islamic state. The purpose of having an Islamic state is to create an environment where people obey Allah and they are kept away from disobeying Allah. As for the issue of the person's sincerity, that is not something you can force. You can't force someone to be sincere. But you can force the person to do what is right outwardly and to abstain from what is wrong outwardly. In fact, if you don't do that, then corruption and filth will appear on the face of the land and the sea. This is the reality. Because human beings, it is in their nature. And this shows the wisdom and the perfection of the way of life, the deen, the sharia that Allah has revealed. It, <coughs> it, is, part, <coughs> it is part of the human nature. Excuse me. That when you see somebody doing something evil, and when your nafs, your hawa, your desires, are inclined towards that evil, when you see somebody else doing it, then it is part of human nature that you become more inclined to commit that sin. So the more you are surrounded by evil, the easier it becomes for you to commit that evil. In fact, it may go to such an extreme that you begin to treat this evil as a norm. You begin to treat this evil as a norm. You think this evil is a normal thing. And you may even begin to think that this evil is a good thing. So every society, without exception, has a set of standards which they try to apply. I, this is an argument I, I viewed it, you know, this is an argument I used in Speaker's Corner in London. There were, there, were, there were some girls arguing with me about, oh, you Muslims, you this and that, and you whatever, and the way you oppress women, and whatever, and you make them cover themselves. We are free in the West. Well, at least... She said this in England, Australia, I don't know that here, right? But she said, we're free. I said, okay, if you're really free, you can take off all your clothes and walk naked down high Park Corner. So she didn't know what to say. I said, why won't you do it? I said, you won't do it because you know you'll be arrested. Because you're not free to walk naked down the street. You have to cover yourself. Even in this society, you have to cover yourself. You are not free to walk naked down the street. But I want to know who defines how much you have to cover and how much you're allowed to show. Who defines it? Who decided you can show you know, this much or this much or this much or whatever? Who decides? Who has written down and decided it? You see, Islam is from Allah. It is not from some people and some human beings who decided on the basis of what? Some random decisions they happen to make at some time. This is from God who knows best the needs of the human beings. I said the difference between <coughs> us and you is we have a higher standard of morality than you do. That's the difference. So this is the issue. No one is free. Freedom does not exist. Freedom is a myth. You are not free at all. Every society has rules which they implement and they enforce upon people. Islam is no different. Except that the rules in Islam are from Allah and they are perfect. The rules from men, they are imperfect. The rules that are from Allah are just and righteous. The rules that are from men may be or they may be not. Some people say, since yeah, I haven't even read this, but I know what it's going to say now. Some people say, since Allah is beautiful and He loves beautiful things, even women can wear decorative clothes in public. Can you clarify this matter? Is Isbal lowering the garment below the ankles haram for men only if you do it out of pride? Okay, there's two questions there. No. Allah is beautiful and He loves what is beautiful, that is right. So there's no harm in women or men or anyone wearing beautiful clothes. But all of that is in the context of the Sharia. So if the, 
the man is allowed to wear beautiful clothes, but for example, they can't be effeminate clothes. They can't be clothes that are like the clothes that women wear. Because Allah has cursed the man who imitates the woman and the woman who imitates the man. Similarly, the woman, she is quite free to wear beautiful clothes, but she is not free, if she is Muslim, she is not free to make tabarraj, to display them to anyone, in fact, except her husband and those who are mahram to her. So it is not allowed for her, therefore, to go out and display these beautiful clothes to everybody. No, that's not correct. Allah is beautiful and He does what is beautiful. But there is an overriding benefit in the woman covering that beauty when she goes out. And there is an overriding harm if she displays that beauty when she goes out. That's why, in fact, she is ordered to cover. It's part of her social responsibility. Her responsibility not only to herself to protect her dignity, but also uh, her responsibility to society as well. Okay? So, uh, this is obviously trying to twist uh, the, the argument, or not in fact really understanding uh, what is the saying of the Prophet about Allah being beautiful and He loves what is beautiful. In fact, we would say that the Muslim woman, when she covers herself, Alhamdulillah, that is beautiful in the sense that this is a sign of piety. And what is more beautiful, subhanAllah, than piety? SubhanAllah. And as for the Isbar, uh, this is not a correct argument to say that uh, my garment is lowered and it goes below my ankles, but I don't do it out of pride. That's not correct. Because in fact, there is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, and, the, and, and it says that the isbal is from pride. It is from pride. So it's from pride itself. And not all the hadith concerning isbal say that it is from pride. In fact, the isbal or to lower for men, for men only, to lower the garment below the ankle uh, is something that is forbidden. And it is a major sin. It is a major sin to lower the garment. However, I have to say that there is one issue that is something that is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars and that is to what is, does the term isbal actually refer to this is actually something which the scholars have differed about so some scholars do not accept that the word term isbal refers to trousers they say the term isbal only refers to the, the you know the izar or the garment you know the thing that you wrap around your waist that the isbal is a particular, referring to a particular type of garment and that they restrict it only to that garment. <coughs> However, it seems to me that purely for this, uh, if, if nothing else, to leave what is doubtful and to be safe, that it would seem to me that one should not uh, leave your garment trailing, whether it is that garment or not, because to leave your trousers below your ankle would also seem to me to be at least, you could say, in danger of falling into that. So the people who say it is only uh, it's only haram when I do it out of pride, no, it is from pride. It's from pride itself. Okay, uh, and that is a, 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 a not correct argument to say that it's only from pride. <coughs> okay, someone wants to know about Maulid celebrating the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I presume you want to know whether it's an innovation or not. There are some, there are some scholars, some ulama, like for example uh, Imam Sayyidi, uh, he is one of them, who permitted uh, the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in fact encouraged it. Uh, however, the first thing to note is that even what he permitted concerning celebrating the birthday of the Prophet uh, is not what the people do today. He only encouraged people to read something from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ at that day and to increase, for example, in their saying uh, and their sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. As for what the people do in these days by way of marches and uh, festivities and in fact uh, sometimes even making statements of shirk and kufr and making the Prophet ﷺ equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then no scholar has allowed, no true scholar has allowed that. However, many other ulama 
have not allowed the celebrating of the birthday of the Prophet and they have said that this is an innovation and as far as I am concerned this is the truth without any shadow of doubt. I am absolutely convinced that celebrating the birthday of the Prophet is an innovation and simply by the simple fact that the Prophet never celebrated his birthday uh, he did not choose a day in the year to celebrate his birthday the only thing that the Prophet mentioned about his birthday is that he used to fast on Mondays and Thursdays and the reason he fasted on Monday is because it was his birthday as for choosing a day in the year, in fact it is not even authentically known the day on which the Prophet ﷺ was born. There is no authentic narration that we know the exact day of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet did not order it, nor did the companions of the Prophet ever celebrate his birthday. In fact, the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ did not begin until over 300 years after the time of the Prophet <coughs> If it was something from our deen, and there are only two Eids, as the Prophet clearly said, there are only two Eids, we only have two Eids in this religion. Two times of celebration. Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. These are the two Eids in Islam. So that without doubt it seems to me that if it was not part of the deen in the time of the Prophet wasallam, how can it be part of our deen today? And if this is not an innovation and if this does not fit the definition of innovation, I don't know what does. An innovation is by definition something that is done in imitation of the Sharia that has no proof either in the action itself or in the manner in which the action is done. So this celebrating the birthday of the Prophet has no proof, not the action itself, and certainly not in the manner in which the action is done. So it would seem to me that this is a mistaken isjihad of the scholars who say that it is permissible uh, to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, and those scholars who say that this is an innovation, it seems to me clear that their position is the strong one and the correct one, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows best. Brother, these days, Women's Day is celebrated. Please tell us something about such celebrations in Women's Day. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Women's Day. How about Men's Day? See? Exactly, sexist. I said, come on brothers, I think we're going to have to now start a Men's Day celebration. All of these things, Men's Day, Women's Day, Mother's Day, Grandmother's Day, Grandfather's Day, First Cousin, Third Hand, Remove Day. <laughs> what next day? Do pet Dog Day. All of these things have nothing to do with our Dean. In fact, these are all pathetic and sad attempts by the Kuffar in order to make right the gross imbalances and injustices that exist in their society. This is the reality. So brothers and sisters, we should really avoid having anything to do with those things. <coughs> Unless, you know, there may be some, for example, if there's a conference or something, and there may be some benefit in order to go there and give dawah or something like that, <coughs> it's really your intention, then alhamdulillah, but your intention is not to participate with them in the celebration, only the overriding benefit of calling the people to Islam. So there may be some benefit in that, but to get involved in it and to agree with it, and this is only from their deficiency in their way of life, which alhamdulillah, we don't have that. Is kissing, uh, someone has to ask this, right? Is a kiss considered a major sin, kissing the opposite sex? Then uh, the truth is that a man came, uh, I have, this is anyway, we're not, subhanAllah, we have to just ask me the knowledge now, I can't hide it, even if I think there might be a benefit in hiding it. But the truth is that a man came to the Prophet and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I kissed a woman who was not mahram for me, I kissed her, and uh, you know, what should I do? What is my repentance? And the Prophet said, Did you pray? And he said, Yes. And he said, So what came uh, after? Uh, expiated from what for what came before, meaning the prayer expiates for the minor sins. 
And the man, he said, is this for me only messenger of Allah or, or is this for everybody? And he said, no, this is for everybody. However, this is not. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want any brother or sister to think. Because I have to say, subhanAllah, the Sahaba were the people of real piety. You know? And they did not consider even the minor sins to be, subhanAllah, insignificant. And the truth is, brothers and sisters, that anything like this, even, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, if a man touches a woman, touches a woman that is not mahram to him, it is better that he should drive a red hot poker, you know, a red hot iron into his head, than he should touch a woman that is not mahram to him. Okay? So it is something really why, brothers and sisters, because it leads to evil. You know? The reality is that if you start with the kiss, it is not going to end there. It's not going to end there. It's going to go further and further until it ends in something really calamitous. Islam, alhamdulillah, does not only protect us from the sins, but it protects us from the avenues that lead to the sins. That's why the hijab. That's why the lowering of the gazes. That's why the segregation of the sexes in Islam. That is why so many things in Islam are there to keep us away from the sins for evil, from even coming near to the sins. So don't think therefore that because it's a, a minor sin, uh, that therefore it's something that we should take lightly. No. It is a door to evil. It is a door to evil. And as the Prophet said, as I mentioned, it's better to, you know, cauterize yourself with a hot iron than to touch a woman that is not mahram to you. This is a good question, but it's going to take too long. Someone asked, what are the newly innovative things in society? Innovations, by the way, do not mean things like, you know, video cameras and uh, computers, and some people say they use this, this is their argument. They say, oh, so if innovations are not allowed, and new things are not allowed, we can't drive cars, we can't use the radio, we can't use the TV, they're all innovative things. But these things are not done in imitation of the Sharia. They are not acts of worship. They are not in imitation of the Sharia. These are things from the dunya. The things from the dunya are permissible. In general, everything from the dunya is permissible unless there is a clear evidence to make it forbidden. The, the way for the things from deen and acts of worship is the opposite. Everything, cons everything by way of acts of ibadah, all acts of worship are forbidden except that which has been taught to us in the sunnah of the Prophet So the issue for acts of ibadah and acts of the dunya are, are, are completely different. Okay? Are different. So, um... That's just to mention that, you know, innovative things does not mean therefore driving motor cars and so on and so on and so forth. These are not what we mean by bid'ah. Bid'ah is things in the religion. Okay. The Khalifa Omar was the one responsible for starting the practice of praying Quran in Jama'ah during Ramadan. Yet no one considers this an innovation. How then do we define what is and what isn't an innovation? Okay, uh, this is not correct. Omar ibn al-Khattab did not start the practice of the people uh, reading the Tarawah prayers in Jamaat. In fact, the Prophet wasallam started that. He led the people in Jamaat for Tarawah for two nights. Then on the third night, the Prophet ﷺ did not come out, although the people were waiting. And the Prophet ﷺ said that I saw what you were doing and I approved of it, but I did not come to lead you in prayer because I was afraid that if we continued with this, that Allah would have made it an obligation upon you and it would have been a hardship for my own. So the Prophet did lead the Muslims in Jama'ah for the Tarawah. And it was not something that was innovated by Umar ibn al-Khattab. This was something that was reintroduced. It was reintroduced. So when Umar 
he got the people to pray behind one imam and as he said what a good bid'ah this is he did not mean this is a new thing in the religion because the word bid'ah in Arabic has a linguistic meaning as well as a sharia meaning it has a linguistic meaning meaning it means different things in the language and it also means something in the sharia for example this video camera is a bid'ah but it is not the type of bid'ah that was forbidden by the Prophet 